So we're going to be continuing in Acts. You know, last week I surprised everybody and said not Acts, but we went to Psalm 110 in verse 4. But today we're going to be, we're going to be back in the book of Acts. And a couple things I just want to, want to clarify. Once again, the book of Acts is a book of transition. It's often controversial when, when people don't take that into consideration. When they apply different portions for everyone, it becomes confusion. Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, we've already been seeing there's a specific application to a, a specific people, and that is to the nation of Israel. And that continues and starts to fade out about Acts chapter 9 around Paul's conversion. And then the focus begins to go to the Gentiles, of which last I knew we are of, of the Gentiles. So we have full salvation. But I want to pick it up in, in Acts chapter 2, in, in verse number... Let's go reading from verse 20. Actually, go, go from verse number 29 and we'll read through the end of the chapter in verse 47 to get the context once again. What did I say, verse 29? Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption." This Jesus hath God raised from, raised up, wherein we are all witnesses. Excuse me, do you know where Teacher Helen's Sunday School stuff is? Right there. Okay. Here we go. It's a good interruption. Tell her I hid it from her. <laughs> I looked, my, I'm focused, and I looked, looked in the corner of my eye. <laughs> it's good interruption, so. What verse was I on now? Uh, verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers." And fear came upon every, one, every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, 
and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Amen. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless your word to us this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see that Peter presented unto the people, they presented not only the crucified Christ, but the resurrected Christ. He was not in the tomb like David was in the tomb. He was alive. He was risen. And as we looked at last week, we looked at the transference of the priesthood from the Levitical priesthood to the, to the, the high priesthood, the everlasting priesthood of Melchizedek. And because of that, Jesus Christ is alive today, and He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He is fulfilling His priestly obligations today. We don't have to go to anybody else, but we can go right to Jesus. Amen. I like that song, Tell It to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus alone. Because all other priests are frail. They're all sinners. But Jesus Christ, that great high priest, is totally sin-free. What a mediator we have in Christ Jesus. So we, so we turn now. They heard this. And what happened in verse number 37? Uh, I mean, yeah, verse 37. Now we, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They heard that they had crucified the Lord of glory. Had elsewhere in Scripture in 2 Corinthians, had they not crucified, had they, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but they were blind. They were looking for that earthly king. They were looking for a conqueror that would throw those rascally Romans out. So they rejected the true Messiah. So they were pricked in their heart. This is the only time this, this word is used in the entire Bible. What it was, they were agitated. It struck to the core of them. And they were asking, what shall we do? It's a good question to ask. Have you ever been so agitated? You can do one of two things. And this is what happened. They were agitated in their heart. They were pricked. It can go both ways. You can say, all right, what do I do? Or you can get angry and walk away. Unfortunately, most people would get angry and walk away rather than hear the truth. Remember the first time somebody told you you were a sinner? Did you like that? I certainly didn't. Even my mother told me, you're not a sinner, you're a good boy. Mom, that's a lie. But that's the truth, is that we need the truth and this truth of the Messiah and what they had collectively done to him, it, it really cut them to the heart. It pricked them, it stabbed them. That's what the word says here. They were pricked into their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? This is happening. We understand it, what should we do? I'm going to get into a little controversy here, I think, in the next verse. And I think it's important to, to look at it for what it says. Like I said, I've had to adjust my old thinking a little bit and look, actually looking at the text here. Then Peter said unto them, Repent! Now, if you grew up in old religious Baptistic tradition, you learn that repent means you need to change all of your life. You need to, every little sin that you can think of, that you need to change. That's what John MacArthur teaches. That's what he teaches, the lordship salvation. You don't have the assurance of salvation because you might not have repented enough for the sins. Well, that's absolute garbage. Right. Repent. The Greek word is metanoia, which means to change your mind. You know what it takes to change your mind? Just changing your mind. It's simple. If you hear two things and you believe one and finally realize what you've heard before is wrong, you repent and you think accordingly as to what the right thinking would be. 
don't know if that was circular logic there, but, but right thinking requires repentance. Let me give you an example here. Say you grew up, and this is kind of talking about the public schools today, one and one can equal five. If you feel like it, it's okay. It's okay. You can think that one and one is five, but when you realize that the objective truth is one and one is two, and you, and you have always believed it's five, you need to repent and think correctly based on the objectivity of mathematics. We have the same thing with the Word of God. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. It says, here's what you do. Change your mind and then get baptized. But only this time it's going to be in the name of Jesus. That's the difference here. And he goes on further. It says, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Now here's where I want to look at a little bit here, the word for. In this case, as well as back in, in Mark 1 and in Luke chapter 3, dealing with the baptism of John, or John's baptism, the same word is used, it says, for the remission of sins. Now I've been errant in this. The word for here is the word ice, the Greek word ice, which means unto or to the remission of sins. There's a couple other Greek words that are usually translated as for. There is gar, that means because. This is not the case here. This is for the remission of sins. Literally, they were commanded by Peter that the king is going to be coming back any time you need to be washed for your sins. Later on, Peter would correct that, and he would say that baptism is for a clean conscience, not for the filth. But here, it was to the Jew that they need to be baptized, and they need to be get ready, because the king is coming back at any time. This was still being offered even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, something I want to go backwards a little bit here. Something I read this morning, it really, I really thought this was pretty neat. I never thought of it this way. If you want to look at the book of Acts, we need to look at it starting at the miracle of the day of Pentecost. Well, by the way, today is the Feast of Pentecost that many, many celebrate. We don't celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. We celebrate the risen Savior. But... But the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given. It was a great miracle in what happened earlier in Acts chapter 2, marking the beginning of the church. The end of the church age will happen when? It'll happen at the rapture of the church. Another great miracle that'll mark. So it's like two bookends. There, the Spirit's here, comes in Acts. I should do it this way because that's the way you guys see the, the Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, and the Spirit goes at the rapture of the church. He that withholdeth, who, that now letteth, will be taken away. There will be no more restraint on the earth of sin because the church will be gone. Do you realize that we, as the church today, we are that salt and light. We are those, those people that have a semblance of why the earth why anybody still is on this earth. Imagine a world without Christians. I shudder to think of that. But when the rapture happens, there will be no more restraint on this earth. Another thing I, I thought of this, this morning as well is with the book of Acts, I like to do photo editing and video editing. And there's a neat tool called the blur tool. Have you ever used the blur tool? That's when you can take and blur out anything else except for what you want to highlight. And that's how we need to look at the book of Acts. The beginning of the book of Acts starts out blurry, kind of, kind of hazy, and that you can't really understand it until you get further in, then it starts getting unblurred. And that's what happens as we see the entrance of Paul onto the scene and, and his, his doctrine of the grace of God would change everything. But this repentance, 
this repentance and being baptized was a literal baptism for the remission of sins. Today, the church doesn't, ba- doesn't practice baptism for the remission of sins. It practices baptism as a memorial of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. He died, was buried, and he rose again. It's a picture of that. Unfortunately, throughout the years, people have taken this, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, they have added to that and tried to apply that to the church. We can't. The only way I've been able to do is to take ice and change it to gar to, because of the remission of sin. I've been, I gotta admit my, to my error there, but this is when you start looking at the text and properly dividing the word of God. It was for their forgiveness. See, the Holy Spirit, and when God himself dealt with Israel nationally, when you see Israel being dealt with, He never talks of individual salvation that would come later with the mystery. And Paul, given that mystery that we find in Ephesians chapter 2 and 3, that we find in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that we find in Colossians 1, the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of all glory. This was the change. This was the transition in the book of Acts. So what's happened in Who was I talking about? We were talking about Luther and his hatred for the Jews. Luther, Luther, Martin Luther actually hated the Jews. There's plaques up at at the Wittenberg church of a pig kicking the Jews out. He hated the Jews so much. But I almost said fortunately, unfortunately, his hatred of the Jews, actually Calvin hated the Jews, Many of the Protestant reformers hated the Jews. So what did they do? They wiped the Jews out of the Bible. They, they now took the Bible, and instead of applying that which belongs to Israel and the Jews, they now say it's for everyone. So that's how they could take this verse and say, well, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. That's why much of the Reformed Church and the Protestant Church teaches infant baptism. They believe that little child can be baptized and he'll now become not only the elect, he'll have the outlook of being saved. Some, have, some still call it a sacrament. When I was a Roman Catholic, we practiced the seven sacraments. One of those sacraments was the sacrament of the Eucharist, which is a takeoff of the Lord's Supper. That Eucharist is... That's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ over and over and over again. And again, read Hebrews chapters 8, 9, and 10, and we find that there was one sacrifice. And he was sacrificed, and now he's the high priest of our confession in heaven. Then, not only sacramentally, much of the Reformed Church still teaches the Lord's Supper and baptism as sacraments, but they get a little bit sneakier. They now call it means of grace. How do I define a means of grace? Well, you have to do these in order to get the grace of God. I would correct that and say we get to do those things because of the grace of God. We do not earn grace. There is not grace conferred by any action that we do on this earth, whether it be baptism or whether it be the Lord's Supper. We have complete salvation today. That wasn't the case in the early portion of the book of Acts. They had a, they had a salvation, and it wasn't contingent on their actions, but their actions and their traditions were there still. We, even the way we just read, we saw once they believed, they went to the temple. They went from house to house. That was because they had to, because they were ostracized by all the people that had rejected Christ. So they, they had, a, they had a, uh, this, this baptism, 
It was for the sin. It was for national repentance. The kingdom would still be offered. We see that the, the stoning of Stephen brought on the conversion of Paul and things changed then. But still, the whole book of Acts is about this transition. Let's turn over to uh, Let's, let's look at Paul for a second. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And I won't read all of Acts chapter 9, even though it's an incredible uh, story. Acts chapter 9, down in... Verse number, let's go to verse 1. It's a great picture here. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. So we see Paul, what he was. He was just like the rest of the nation of Israel. He was killing those disciples that were, that were confessing Christ. He would have been there, well, he was there at the baptism of Stephen, consenting unto Stephen's death in the chapter before, or two chapters before, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuteth thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuteth. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He was resisting the grace of God. He, he was going against God's will in sending the Messiah. He was going along with the religious traditions that we see in the book of Galatians. We learned that Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was the, the mightiest of the religious world in, the, in his day. Paul, more than likely the most learned man of the time, and yet here was Jesus himself saying, how can you continue to kick against what is going on from me? And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Let me stop there for a second. Also, another thing not to do with the Acts, with the book of Acts, is treat it as a model for you to follow. This isn't a model for you. Oh, a voice told me to go into the city. No, we have a sure word. This was a specific purpose, a specific experience for Paul. We can't add Bob's name or Mike's name to here. Mike, go into the city and the Lord will show you what to do. No, we have a more sure word. We have the word of God, and we have the grace of God and the knowledge of God, and God uses all that together where we can actually think, and we can decide on our own what things are from God. So, side note, done. And, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord." And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, who, behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming to and putting his hand on him, 
that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. This guy's a wicked man, and you're sending me unto him? What's going on here? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Just, he was just like Jonah was. Don't send me. Paul was every bit as nasty as the Chaldeans were. He would have, he would have ripped any person that came against him to shreds. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Let me take another little side step. Look at the word chosen here. This, this requires much more detail later. But we have this tendency when we see the word chosen or elect to apply it to salvation. But chosen here in this case, it was, he wasn't chosen to salvation, he was chosen to service. He was chosen to bring the name of the Lord unto the Gentiles and also the kings in which he did. So that's a little side note. Remember that when you're reading your Bible, if one says, think of this for a second, the question, was Judas Iscariot saved? Jesus said, I have chosen all of you, but one of you is a devil. Did Jesus choose Judas for salvation, or did he choose him for the apostleship? It makes a difference. Think of that for a second. Think through the scriptures. We tend to think always. That's this kind of Calvinist, Arminian viewpoint. Both are the same, by the way. They look at every time the word chosen or elect is used, and they apply it to salvation, when in reality, most of the time when those words are used, it applies to service. So just another little side note we can look at another time. Maybe another Wednesday night sometime, we looked at the word elect and, and where it applies, about the Lord Jesus Christ, about Israel, and those elected or predestined even to service. So we'll do that with chosen some other time. But it's interesting when you look and when you come upon that word chosen, it, it usually has to do with service, not salvation. And there's this false argument out there, well, from the Calvinist, you must be an Arminian because you believe in free will. No, they, they're both wrong. They both would say chosen is about salvation. So both the Calvinists and the Arminians are wrong. I, I, you know what I like to call myself? A Biblicist. Neither a Calvinist or a Minian or any other Indian or anything out there, but a Biblicist. And, and what happens is though we're not perfect, we, we look at the Word of God for who it, or, yeah, that's right, who it is, who He is, and, and not with our own interpretation. So that's what we all need to strive to do. What what is he saying? But we tend to put our old theological assumptions into play and we apply that to us. All right, another side note gone. I'm never going to finish what I had started this morning. <laughs> Anybody remember what verse I left off you? All right, verse 16, for, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. How do you like that for being chosen? So chosen to service and chosen to suffer. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So he be, receive his sight and then be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to go to another place that will clarify that a little more. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Let's go over to Acts chapter 22. We're going to look at Paul's words and how he, how he describes this to, to Luke 
Acts chapter 22. And really, we need Acts chapters 21 and 22 together because this is all Paul's, Paul's testimony before, before Caesar. And, and the, both chapters deal with this, but I just want to look at uh, one or two or maybe three particular verses in chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse number... It, he, he retells the story for the most part. And he, in verse number... F- 13, uh, verse number 12. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. So we see again the choosing of, of Saul to be the witness of Christ. And now, verse number 16, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Paul, still in that, before he actually received the mystery of salvation, he went and he followed and he was baptized for the remission of sins. As a Jew looking forward to the coming kingdom of God, which could have been imminent at then as he retells that story. Clearly, there is a difference. There is a difference. So we see it all in transition in the book of Acts. One of the place, Acts chapter 10. This is regarding Cornelius. Acts chapter 10. I could go to a multiple of places. I don't know if I'll have time to. Acts chapter 10. Cornelius was a devout man. Peter was summoned to go to him through a vision. He had a vision of the sheet, which actually showed him that there was nothing unclean, especially Gentiles, unto God. All were clean before him. So he went, and he, and and at the same time, Cornelius had a vision. Cornelius was an Italian. He was a centurion. Cornelius was a just man, more than likely looking at being becoming a Jewish convert as well. So he would have been gone, gone through the same thing. He would have been baptized into being a Jew. Let's go down to verse number 40. Let's go to Peter's testimony here in verse 34. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. The baptism of repentance, national repentance for Israel. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are, we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of Ju- the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. See Peter's focus once again on they, on the nation of Israel, slewing, if that's a word, Peter uses it here. Uh, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. 
I love that he was, he was an open triumph over sin at the cross. And the resurrection was open with the many witnesses that, that saw Jesus. Not to all the people. Didn't go to everyone. Just, but unto witnesses chosen before of God. See, again, there's that word chosen. They were chosen as witnesses. doesn't deal with salvation here. Chosen as witnesses before God, even to us. Peter talking about his apostleship here. Even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and, to, and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Notice earlier in the book of Acts, after they were baptized, they received the Holy Ghost. Now here in Acts chapter 10, these, these Gentile converts to, to Judaism now receive the Holy Ghost first. Now this is a picture almost of where we are today with the role of baptism and the Holy Spirit in the Christian. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. They received it without the baptism of repentance. They received it without the washing away of their sins unto repentance, unlike the nation of Israel. And look at the reason. Anytime you had people speaking in tongues, showing those things, it was for the benefit of the Jews. Here, it was so the Jews could see, yes, that God has, is no respecter of persons, and His Word would go out to all. All of the instances no matter what, whether it were Jews that were speaking or Gentiles speaking, it was for the benefit as a testimony to the Jews that God was now in the business of giving the Gentiles salvation because of their rejection. Verse number 46, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So they heard that they were glorifying God. They didn't hear just some kind of gibberish. They heard the magnifying God. Amen. That was who gets magnified. You know, modern tongue speaking, it's not about magnifying God. It's about saying, look at me. Look at how great I am. That's what it does. Put the spotlight on me. Spotlight went on Jesus in this case. They glorified God. Now, verse 47. This is where I wanted to get to originally. Can any man, and then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which has, have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. See, there's something missing when the Gentiles here, they didn't have the baptism for remission of sins. They had the Holy Ghost and they were baptized. Later, a little difference there. Another place to look at is, let's go to Acts 19. Another, open up a controversial can of worms here sometimes. Acts chapter 19. We can go back to 18 as well. Now this one was one that, I was always confused at until you learn to, to take the Bible and, and, and correctly cut it. Acts chapter 19, verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So, what happened? 
And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. They were baptized in for the remission of sins, looking forward to the king. They had John's baptism. What did also John say? They said there would be another one that would come after me that will baptize with the Holy Ghost. And of course, we could add the fire there for those who rejected. And then, then said Paul, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people which they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve, not twelve years old, but there were twelve men. <laughs> and, he, and he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the, king, uh, persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. I could keep going, but I think I'm going to end there. So he again, where did Paul go? He went into the synagogue to persuade those who meet in synagogues. Persuade those Jews to, to receive the kingdom of God. Amen? So there's a difference. Let's go to Acts chapter 18. Acts 18. I try to remember my, my verse number here. I know we're going to start in verse number one here as well. Acts 18. Now we're on our way into Corinth. We went backwards. We went from Corinth to Ephesus. We're going back to Corinth now. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So if you got that, they were back. They were in Athens. They had been in Rome. They were, they were Jews. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them. So Paul, Paul, being a tent maker or a worker of leather, would probably be more accurate. He was a worker of leather. He abode with, with Priscilla and Aquila. And wrought by their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. He didn't go to the church on the Lord's Day at the time. He reasoned on the Sabbath, on the seventh day when they met and persuaded the Jews. Who else was there in this mixed multitude? The Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy, Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves, I always like that, the greatest opposition is those that oppose themselves. They opposed themselves and blasphemed. He shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. That's us. That's where Paul, though the, the Jews had rejected Christ, that's where Paul finally he turns to those Gentile believers because the Jews rejected. That was a game changer. It was a game changer in the history of humanity because now no longer would people have to go under, under the Jewish ritualisms. Jesus, the high priest, would be sufficient unto salvation and unto sanctification and unto glorification just as well. Let's turn and kind of in closing, not quite though. What about, what about the Christian baptism? There is a difference. We've seen the transition from the Jew to the Greek. We don't have the baptism of repentance today. We don't get baptized because we have repented or we don't 
get baptized to repent or for salvation. That's all been co-opted by much of the religious world today. It is the Holy Spirit that does the baptizing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is being baptized into Christ. The reason you are a Christian today is because the Holy Spirit baptized you into Christ. He baptized you into the body of Christ. We'll look at a couple scriptures in a minute. Whereas God dealt with the Jews nationally, and he will too. Like I said, the beginning of the church began with the miracles of the Holy Spirit coming down. The, the end of the church age will be when the Holy Spirit departs, will leave. The witness of the Spirit will no longer be here as, as known today. You and I are privileged that we can be saved on an individual basis by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He deals with us individually. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians 12, I'm just going to look at a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 12. And I always have to... I always have to make a note of this every time I go into the book of Corinthians, especially chapters 12, 13, and 14. We often make the mistake, and even though chapter 13 is lovely, it's beautiful with all of the words about love. If you do all things, but you don't have love, you're like a clanging bell. It makes nice note cards and stuff like that, nice memes. Nice pillows. I think we have a pillow or a hanging on the wall. I love conquers all. That's not the reason chapter 13 it's there, was there. Chapter 13 of, the, of 1 Corinthians were there for the proper use of the gifts given in chapter 12. Or, or the, not the proper use, the, the motivation for the gifts of chapter 12. Any spiritual gift is not for the reason of people becoming pumped up with themselves. It's for the edification of the body. And that's, that's what it talks about. Just as that person doesn't have the Holy Ghost come upon them so they can make a spectacle of on themselves, the inward dwelling of the Spirit benefits all. That's in, in 1 Corinthians 14. But 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll, we'll, we'll blast through this in like five minutes here. And we'll, we'll cover it some more. Verse number 12 of 1 Corinthians 12 says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond, bond or free, and have made, been made to drink unto one Spirit. See, the same Holy Spirit is who brings people in to a relationship with Christ. Remember, the works of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16 are most important. They are to testify of Christ, His truth and righteousness, and to convict of sin. Those are all individual bases. For the body is not one member, but many. Now leave it right there, baptized into one body. Let's go over to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And here's a little note too. Ephesians deals primarily with the body of Christ. Verses, chapters 1 through 3 give you the doctrine the body needs to be healthy. And chapters 4, 5, and 6, Paul gives us what we do because of being a healthy body. And then Colossians deals with the head of the body. Who is who? Jesus Christ. So Ephesians chapter number 4. My fingers are sticking. Ephesians chapter 4, early on, Verse number one, and we're just going to go through verse six. 
I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, no longer Jew and Gentile. There is one body and one spirit. Not the one that has you blabbing and grabbing, but one spirit which baptized you into that body. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called on, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That one baptism is spirit baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in y'all. Amen? Amen? So we see the, do we see the change, the transition that we've seen in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts? Let's go, where else do we want to go? Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 11 and 12. I like just the first two words. In whom. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. There's another distinction between the old and new. Even in the early church, those Jews would still be practicing circumcision. Many do today. There are health benefits of course, but they did it. And guess who was excluded from that ritual? The women were. So now we have men, women, everybody can be circumcised. Try that. But it's a spirit circumcision, as Paul points out. You know, made with a circumcision, made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It's not water baptism. It's not going to the Jordan River. It's not being sprinkled, dipped, or, whatever, or having water thrown at you. It's the inward circumcision of Christ. Verse number 12, buried with him in baptism. So we don't have a baptism unto repentance and remission of sins. We now have a baptism into his death. And praise the Lord, part of that baptism is we've share in eternal life as well. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And I just have to go here. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Amen. So you see the inward work instead of the external work going on still. Blotting out the, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now let me challenge your thinking once again. And I think I mentioned this over the last few weeks. Our statement of faith says there's two ordinances. There's the ordinance of baptism, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. I suggest ordinance isn't a real good word for that. I think a memorial or a commemoration would be in line, because what does this verse right here say? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So all that, all that we cannot earn anything. Baptism, Lord's Supper is no way to be saved, no way to keep saved. They are symbols of what has taken place inwardly. Let me go on to some more scripture so I can, I can close up here. Uh, Romans 6. Romans 6. I think we all know these verses. Verse, verse 1. This is a good answer to the people who have easy believism, even though believing is easy, but our hearts are hardened. 
What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Try it. If you're a Christian, I dare you. I double dog dare you, try to sin. If you're looking at the grace of God and what Christ has done, you won't, get a long, you won't like to sin for very long. He'll get a hold of you. Because grace doesn't teach us that we can sin. Grace teaches us that Christ has overcome sin on our behalf. But know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. Again, that spirit baptism baptizes you into Christ, baptizes you into the body. Out, uh, the physical act of baptism is a picture of that. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Not the old sinful nature, but newness of life. After all, we have a future hope. We have a secure hope in the one that cannot ever fail in Christ Jesus. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Praise God for that. One more place in closing. Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter 3. And remember, the book of Galatians was directed to those that were trying to bring people who believed back unto the law. Galatians chapter 3. Let's go down to... I know. <laughs> I want to go a little... I wanna, it's going to take longer trying to, uh, to figure out how not to take so long. Let's go further. 8 sounds like a good place. Let's go to, down to 10. Let's start there. For as many as are of the works of the law under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of law to do them. In other words, if you're going to follow the law, you better be 100% uh, <laughs> 100 in obedience. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. See, when you look back at some groups, they'll say, you need to persevere in the faith. You're going to keep on looking back at the law and wondering, have I done enough? But really, Christ is the one that did it all. Amen. Amen. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ, I love the word here, hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Not baptism, nothing else. Through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm glad all the promises of God are through Christ Jesus, nothing else. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. See, the law was given because of disobedience. It showed disobedience to the law. But the promises to Abraham are still there. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Therefore, then serveth the law. 
It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator, mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded, all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Amen. Men, believe the gospel. That is the hope. Don't believe, you don't have to believe the gospel and be baptized. Don't have to believe the gospel today and do any works of righteousness. They're not means of grace, but believing the gospel means full salvation in the age we're in today. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Amen. And again, that faith has an object. It's not faith in faith, it's faith in Jesus Christ. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster or tutor. For ye, have, ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Yes, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one body made of Jew and Greek together. For as many of you, this is what I wanted to get to, I could have gotten here just without the first verses. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So the baptism, again, this is spirit baptism by the context. You're baptized into Christ. You have put on Christ. Yes, we see us with our shirts and ties and dresses, but God sees us with a robe of righteousness. We have put on Christ. He is before us. He is the one that is the owner of our salvation. And we just trust in Him and what He's done. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Right. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one circumcision. It's of the heart. It's where all this takes place. Spiritual baptism being baptized into Christ. Verse number 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Yes, we in the church, we have been given the blessing that salvation is by grace through faith in the baptism of Jesus Christ or the baptism into Jesus Christ. And we will be grafted in or are grafted in with the promises to Abraham. There'll be one day, I don't know how exactly how it'll be, but one day we will rule and reign with Christ Jesus. I don't know what capacity that'll be. We could probably rule as a janitor in the New Jerusalem. That'd be pretty good. But today, we look at these things. We ha don't have the commandment anymore to be baptized, to be forgiven of our sin. It was just something that was phased out, transitioned out. Today, we believe in Christ. And because we believe in Christ, because the Holy Spirit has drawn us, has worked in us, and He baptizes us into Christ, immersed into Christ. Now, the baptism, physical baptism, it's not mandatory. If anybody ever tells you you have to be baptized to be saved or become elect or anything else, they're lying to you. But we, we, we get baptized and encourage baptism as an answer to a clean conscience, as a testimony that you do belong to him rather than yourself. Amen? I like the, I like the words, the song, Now I Belong to Jesus. That's what outward baptism tells everybody else. And he belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Amen. Amen. So praise the Lord that 
we have the Holy Spirit of God, which puts us into Christ. Amen. Think of that when you see people going through rituals and all. But we have Jesus. Amen. Let's.